to the Irvington Historical Society's webinar entitled The Finish Line, a retrospective of Peter Oley, beloved coach and teacher. My name is Scott Mosenthal and I will be your host for today's webinar. Last December, the Irvington Historical Society highlighted one of Irvington's two resident coaching hall of famers. Both of these iconic coaches have achieved mind boggling accomplishments and had a significant influence on thousands of student athletes. Rather amazingly, both lived across the street from each other on Riverview Road in Irvington. Legendary coach Gina Marr and her remarkable varsity girls basketball program was the subject of the December webinar. Today's presentation will feature presenters as well as videos highlighting the impact that Peter Oley, perhaps one of the most influential Irvington residents in the past half century, had on them as a coach, a colleague, and a friend. They range from those who were on Peter's first team in 1956 to the current Irvington High School cross country and track coach who succeeded him in 2007. There have been dozens of written submissions in the past two months from those who remember Coach Oley. Today's four presenters, all former students and athletes of his, have been given the unenviable task of editing those submissions, including their own, into roughly seven minute segments. Please note, however, that we have kept every submission in its entirety, and those will be later posted on the Historical Society's website, as will this webinar. In addition, we have a half dozen video clips from former runners, students, and colleagues. The presentation will last slightly over an hour, and we ask that if you have any comments or questions, please submit those via the chat button at the end of the program. Also, please note that this will hopefully be part one of a two-part series about Peter Rowley. Our goal is to present a future webinar highlighting his significant roles as a village environmental activist and Irvington historian for close to 30 years. My first introduction is the composer and instrumentalist of this webinar soundtrack. Liam Oley, son of Eric and grandson of Peter, is an Irvington High School senior and an accomplished musician and songwriter who in eighth grade composed the music for the Irvington Historical Society's production of An Evening with the Hamiltons. He's a member of the Irvington Cross Country, Indoor Track and Spring Track programs. He plans on pursuing his composing interest in college. We will now begin the program with a poetic rendition of Peter's life and career. A story and rhyme about the master storyteller or a poem about Pete. If you ever met Coach Only, you were quickly taken in by his incredible knowledge and that quirky grin, his unparalleled memory his unquenchable passion made his program unique as his team sprang into action. On a personal note, I was his assistant for years. 23 we worked together, with blood, sweat, and tears. Innumerable trips to races and meets. I heard all of his stories and all their repeats. To spend the full day with Pete was amazing, though others might have reacted with eyes a glazing but i honestly loved his passion for runners track meets and kids were his bread and his butter we gather today in honor of pete to remember the man and his remarkable feats you'll hear from a bunch who recall this man only who impacted their lives in a way almost holy so let's take a look at peter's career if he were here talking it would take most of a year. He grew up in North T-Town, a number of years past. Wash Irving, it said, was enrolled in his class. Pete soon found his forte running on trails on the Rockies estate, where he talked to the quails. To Doc Rasbeck, his coach, Pete was as close as a son. He was a track junkie. He was destined to run. He made the state meet, finished a bit back in the pack, but he was now off and running and never looked back. He was then off to Brockport where he maintained his zeal. He majored in track and minored in field. He decided that teaching would be his career. He started at Dow's Lane, made three grand his first year. Coaching soon followed, his earnings soon flowered. He was coaching three seasons at 
10 cents an hour. At Dow's he held meets where his boys ran like rockets. At the flagpole they'd move with him yelling, hip pockets. The aqueduct became home for the Harrier team. And it wasn't before long that the dogs reigned supreme. The years soon flew by as did Peter's bosses. He outlasted 17. He had fewer career losses. He sowed a few oats and squired a few bells. Drove his cherry red MG like a bat out of hell. He eventually settled down when he married a Finn, his father-in-law through a mean javelin. Children soon followed. The Oles had three. All were track aces, an all-star family. He coached and sold candles and dug all the pits. He forgot not a time, not even a split. The lines he would mark, the track he would drag. To Penn he would go with his green leather bags. He coached in the fall, the spring, and the winter. Throwers and runners, jumpers, and sprinters. More often than not, he'd win, place, or show. A Westchester fixture, his stature did grow. Accolades he accrued, all the state knew his name. State records, state champs, and two halls of fame. Closer to home, there's the trot, the track, and the woods, all named in his honor. This coach was good. Today we look back thanks to his students, colleagues, and runners. His impact's been tremendous. It fills us with wonder. So we'll jog down memory lane with this coach, teacher, and friend, a one-of-a-kind, an Irvingtonian legend. I would, like next, um, I would like next to introduce the presenters. First is Peter's son, Eric, Irvington High School class of 85 and member of numerous Irvington High School cross country and track teams, still holds the school record in the javelin. He has inherited all his dad's running collection, which means he no longer has the use of his basement, his garage or his guest bedroom. But it also means that he provided perhaps 90% of the photos and the documents you will see today. Nancy Fister Jameson, Irvington High School class of 82, was the heart and soul of Coach Ole's early girls cross country and track teams. She was also a student of Coach Ole and has been an elementary school teacher for 30 years. David Darvisey Allison, Irvington High School class of 94, won numerous league and sectional titles and still holds four school records. He also finished third in the class C state cross country meet and later ran at UPenn. Today, he is an accomplished master's runner and is a teacher and track coach in Phoenix, Arizona. Finally, Noah Kornman, Irvington High School class of 92, was a runner for Coach Ole's track teams who won numerous league titles, qualified for the state meet and won the prestigious Con Ed Scholar Athlete Award. He later ran for Columbia University and is currently the executive exec director of SAE, the Stuttering Association for the Young. Let's go now to Eric for his part of the program. Hello, we're gonna start with some memories from the very early years. We'll start with the great Frank Gilligan, IHS class of 1956. I remember Pete helping me with a 100 and 220 yard dash. He told me not to straighten up too fast in the 100 yard dash. My best time in the 100 was 10.4. We ran at Children's Village. We didn't have a track. All the tracks we ran on were cinder, and so we needed spikes. Frank was fast. He made it onto the 1956 Western, Western Westchester League All-Stars. Next is Rick Marshall, IMS class of 1958. What was it like growing up in Irvington during the 1950s? I seldom reminisce about growing up in Irvington without remembering Peter Oli. I was here when he first arrived as an assistant Irvington High School track coach. He was serious and he was humble. And though the magnitude of Peter Ole's success with generations and many hundreds of youth is in the record books, 
his contribution to Irvington is too big to be able to accurately be added up. Next, we have Gene Deutscher, IHS class of 1960. Coach Ole drove me home from practice each day in his red MG. He was a bachelor at the time, residing in North Tarrytown. We lived on his way home. My mother would have, would have dinner waiting for us. The rest of the family had already eaten. Coach Ole even came down to Duke University to talk to the track coach when I visited with my parents. After Duke University, I was an officer in the United States Marine Corps with a duty assignment in Vietnam. I received several handwritten letters from Coach Ole while I was there. Each was a pep talk, you know, just like the ones he would give you five minutes before the gun fired to start the race. You can do this. He was one of the first people I called when I returned to the United States. Thanks to Coach Ole, running has been a part of my life since I met him. He taught me commitment to self and commitment to team. Next up, we have Jim Brennan, another local legend, class of 1965. Coach Ole was like a second father to me. I ran cross country while I was in the seventh and eighth grade, and I was a middle of the pack runner. But at one race at Blue Mountain, I finished 19th out of 150 runners. Coach Ole made a big deal out of it, saying afterwards, I wanna thank Jimmy Brennan for finishing in the top 20 today, great effort. And this gave my ego a tremendous boost. I've never forgotten it. Coach Ole was always encouraging, no matter where someone finished, he always encouraged you to do your best. He always waited at the finish line for the last person to finish and always congratulated them. My son, Kevin, wanted to run cross country for Irvington so he could get a varsity jacket and impress the girls. He was not much of a runner and always finished last. Once, however, he managed to beat another kid at a meet at New Rochelle. Kevin was so happy. He kept saying, I beat someone. And of course, Coach Ole made a big deal out of it, just as he did 35 years earlier for me. He is one of the best people I've ever met. Next, we have Bob Prince, IHS class of 1970. I was a classic underachiever in middle and high school. And as a result, my college applications academically were pretty much laughable. But Pete pushed hard on my behalf, writing letters to his track connections at different colleges. I ended up being accepted at multiple schools and received an excellent college collegiate education, including a master's degree in later years. I'm convinced that this wouldn't have been possible without Peter Oli's efforts. He basically gave me a second chance in the area of academics and the arts, and I took full advantage of what was offered. I owe so much to this man. He was a role model, disciplinarian, mentor, and a really nice guy. He opened a lot of doors for me and many others. Couldn't possibly be more thankful for everything he represented in my life. The end of the decade brought a new red cinder track up to the IHS campus. The late 60s also brought another child into the Ole household, me. Joining my older sister, Anne, and with that came a move to a bigger house on Irving Place and the requisite station wagon, a type of vehicle that would become the Ole family vehicle for a choice for many years to come. First was the, was the 1970 green Pontiac track dragger pictured here. We called it the track dragger because my father would use it to drive around the track, dragging a section of fence when the track surface would become rutted by the rain. My father would put five-year-old me on top of a piece of plywood to weigh down the fence. Not a good idea. I would come home covered in dust and cinders. Yet my mother, desperate for some alone time, still entrusted me to my father's care. Here we are during the 1973 cross country season, an example of what was a typical weekend in my childhood. We even had some moments away from track meets for some father son time doing typical things like throwing the javelin in the backyard. But I finally made it to the high school and could spend some time with my father as my official coach. And we had some great times and we had some great teams. Which brings me to the Ole family vehicle of the 1980s, the Pontiac Catalina Safari Wagon. After the 1983 cross country season, I was fortunate, to make the, fortunate enough to make the section one team that competed in the state federation championships, championships up in Syracuse, along with fellow Bulldogs, Tara and Don Fitzpatrick. Being that we were only three athletes competing for Irvington, my father drove us up to the meet in the giant blue safari wagon. 
It had been a long rainy day, and after the races were over, we were all eager to get home. As my father was racing down I-87, we suddenly saw flashing lights behind the car. We were getting pulled over. My father always talked first. Uh, sorry, officer, we were just driving back from a cross country meet in Syracuse. These kids made the New York State Federation meet. Uh, license registration, please. Um, did you say cross country? I ran cross country in high school. My father looked at his nameplate. Hanson, did you run in New York State? Uh, yes, uh, I grew up on Long Island. I ran at William Floyd High School. For Coach Frank Jones, did you run at the 1974 state meet at Sunken Meadow? Our team came in second that year in Class C. Wait, are you Marty Hanson? You outkicked George Vogel, the best runner from our section that day. You ran a great race, officer. Uh, thank you. Uh, now I need you to obey the speed limit, sir. Please get home safely, and you guys have a good night. He'd gotten out of a speeding ticket. And I remember turning around and looking at Tara and Dawn with our mouths wide open. My father was always telling stories about runners from old, reciting times and places from the past, but this was unbelievable. I don't think we stopped laughing for the rest of that ride home. And finally, after 25 years of coaching, my father got a bus driver's license so he could drive his full teams to train and to race. And I'm sure others will share memories of jump curves and near misses, but I must end it here. Next up, we have Fred Hurlitz and Tom Quinn from the IHS class of 1982. Greetings, Irvington, Tiger Hurlitz, Tom Quinn, here at Fern Hill Park in Portland, Oregon. Um, we are the class of 1982. Correct. Uh, Tom, tell me your favorite Peter Oli story. Well, <laughs> you know, actually, the, the first, I still remember the first time I met Pete. So I was in third grade, and the Dow's Lane Elementary School had what they called the Olympics every year. And there was something called the long run, which, you know, in retrospect, was probably 200 yards. It was one lap around the field. And I ran and I got second. And I was a little disappointed. And I was standing there, so what, I'm nine years old. And this guy, like, emerges from the crowd. And he's got, in my memory, he had a giant beard and giant hair. And he was wearing a tie-dyed shirt and a headband. He looked crazy. <laughs> and he came out and he had his thick bottle glasses. And he was like, that was great, that was great. He was so enthusiastic. And he kept talking about how, when I was in high school, I could run track for him. And I was like, well, you know, I didn't think too much about it. And sure enough, all those years later, I ran. But it wasn't even that long later, because I actually had him as a teacher oh. in fifth and sixth grade. Uh -huh. So, um, and so just what I remember about him from that very first time was just the enthusiasm. Like, he was so enthusiastic yes. about not only my performance, but about running and the future, that it was contagious. It was yeah. amazing. So. You, you were almost recruited, in a way. Yes, he would, he would, well, I don't want to say recruited, but he definitely, you know, introduced, when I was way to introduce himself to me, it was, it was great. And so, it was the um, beginning of my friendship. You, when, when I, I had the opportunity to run with you on, we were on a team together. Many years, Which yeah. was awesome. Um, and so I'm thankful for him to bring people together, which is essentially what he did. Right. Um, tell me also, I recall running with you senior year and you wore red shorts. Why the red shorts? Well, it's not, it's not nothing fancy. The um, Irvington the uniforms were horrible. I don't know if I remember really? correctly, but yeah. they were like green satin with no liners. Yeah. And then they were, I don't know what you were supposed to do. So right. I had a comfortable pair of running shorts that were red and I didn't think a big deal out of it. But, and Pete let me run in them all the time. And of course, one time we won some race and the, the opposing coach complained and they disqualified us after the fact. So I, did, ah. I never got to wear my red shorts. Oh, again, so. got it. So they went away. They went away. Got it. Yeah, they were just nice shorts. That's all. Having been the teacher, um, the thing about Pete too, like he was so into the outdoors. Yes. So that was a big thing for I me. remember that. Very influential. When he, yeah. In third grade, he said, he told me, or sorry, by the time I was in fifth grade, he was describing how he'd taken a three week backpacking trip alone in Wyoming. And yes. to me, that was just like, I'd never known anyone who had done that. Yes. And I was just, that was really influential. And I yes. Pete so much. And, and the other thing is, you know, he built his own house largely. Yes. He, he talked about his, the bean. Yeah, 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 he was, yeah, he was totally the in the wood. Yeah, was like 
you heard yeah. more about the bean than, than ever. And he, so that was interesting that he built his house, and I always thought that was really, you know, because that's fairly uncommon. Did, do you, what I took from the conversation around the beam, it was less about the beam, it was more about the passion he had for the building of this structure. Right. Which did not influence you. I mean. Oh, completely. Like again. The, the outdoors, building. Yep. No, he's very. Using you know, your hands. Yeah. And we, you know, it's, it's so, yeah, he was totally into wood. All the things, he was an amazing, he was a really great teacher. Greetings, Irvington, Tiger Hurlitz, weighing in from the home office in Portland, Oregon, where I've just had the good fortune of visiting with Tom Quinn, and we talk so fondly about Peter Oli, um, and hopefully you see some of that conversation in the video snippets to follow. I remember running for Peter Oli, and uh, if you ran for Peter Oli, you had a huge sense of pride. Um, if you ran cross country or track, you were somebody, and that confidence just helped so much as you were an adolescent and growing up and trying to figure things out. You could have been a high school quarterback on any other team, but if you ran for Peter Oli, you were somebody, and you felt that pride, and you felt that support, and you felt that camaraderie, and you felt that teamwork. Um, I, I take his lessons so, so fondly, and I, I live, live by them daily, and I think about them daily. The guy was a legend. Hi everyone, I'm Nancy Jamison, um, and I was asked to talk today about what it was like to be a female runner on Coach Oli's team. And the answer is really quite simple. Um, to be a runner on Coach Oli's team, to be a female runner on Coach Oli's team was to be a runner on Coach Oli's team. Um, in other words, I really believe that um, Mr. Oli valued each runner for who they were and what they brought to the team. So his passion uh, for coaching really seemed to transcend gender stereotypes. He appreciated us as individual runners on a team and his expectations were high and reasonable for each of us, regardless of our gender. He coached us all with measured skill and often unbridled enthusiasm. All the stories that poured in from former runners students, colleagues, and coaches for this project portray a unique man of compassion and conviction, as well as humor and humility. I'd like to share a few of those stories now. Doug Talbot, class of 1984, wrote in saying, I loved Coach Oli. He played an influential role in my love for running, which led me to run track in college. He was strategic and competitive, yet always took time to make sure we were having fun. Even when he was serious, he always seemed to end with a smile and a laugh. In the fall of 1983, Coach Oli pulled me aside and said very excitedly, Debbie, Debbie, we've got a secret weapon this year. We've got Samantha Kirby. He went on to explain how Sam had spent her whole summer running every day, that she kept getting lost during her runs and ended up running two to three times the distance she had planned. Coach was right, Sam was our secret weapon and we went on to have an awesome season. I enjoyed team dinners at the Oli's house and I loved running with my sister Annie, my friends and my classmates. Good times for sure. We also heard from Michael Bivens, AKA Tank, class of 1982, who wrote, Coach Pete Oli, what an honor and a blessing to be coached by one of the greatest, along with the best assistant coaches. I marveled at how he figured out the track meet in his head, knowing how many points we needed to win even before the meet started. Coach Oli made everyone a winner, not only because of his love for track, but because he was always in the mindset of teaching and coaching and wanting to push us be beyond our limit, trusting that we were always putting our best foot forward. He made sure that he did his job, but he also made sure we stayed honest with ourselves and did our jobs 
by training, studying hard, and being the best we could be. And here's a story from Ivan Sarda, class of 1983, entitled, Holy Moly, What a Close Race. On a sunny weekend morning, the sound of a pistol launched 150 runners off to their last high school cross country race. Determined not to burn out at the start, I had no idea where I stood in the pack as we entered the woods. But Mr. Ole provided a confident and early update. You gotta pick up 15 spots, you can do it. Minutes later, I remember sucking wind and proudly thinking, I must have passed at least a dozen. But there again stood Mr. Ole in the woods with confidence, he reported that I had moved up a number of spots. I struggled past a few more runners, and once again, on a hill, was Mr. Ole. Charge up the hill. When you get to the top, charge down it as, as well. They'll never expect that. I picked up a few more places on the downhill, and towards the end of the woods, one last time, the trusty motivator stood. How does this man keep getting ahead of me, I wondered. Then, with a rush of optimism, he pointed forward and exclaimed, Ivan, you got to pass those two guys. Once again, I felt recharged. When a 3.1 mile race is decided within yards of the finish line, you realize just how fragile the chain of events were. Everything counted along the way. Every update, every piece of advice, every encouraging word, and each resulting boost of energy. No doubt, Mr. Ole stood in all the right places and said all the right things at just the right times. And of course, many of us knew Mr. Ole as one of our first history teachers at Dow's Lane Elementary School. Rob Yazinsack, class of 1985, wrote in saying, Peter Ole was the first teacher to inspire my interest in history in general and of local history in particular. I cherish memories of walks along the old Croton Aqueduct past the mansions and in the woods behind the Irvington Reservoir up to the Hermit's Grave. These field trips off the beaten path piqued my interest and inspired me. Mr. Ole was kind to remember me years after my time in elementary school and to remain a mentor and friend all the way through my college years and beyond. He always greeted me with enthusiasm. Hey Yaz, hey it's the Yaz. I am grateful to have been one of Mr. Ole's students. In acknowledgement of his influence, generosity, and friendship, I dedicated my book, Hudson Valley Ruins, co-authored with my friend Tom Rinaldi, to Peter Ole, and also to Tom Johnson, another Irvington school teacher. Mr. Ole and Mr. Johnson helped me find the subject interest that still remains my passion, the roots of which go all the way back to Peter Ole's history lessons in elementary school. I too was inspired by Mr. Ole as both my teacher and as my coach. His lessons were engaging, his enthusiasm was contagious, and his classroom had no walls, literally and figuratively. He had a deep compassion and connectedness to the natural world that really guided and gilded his teachings. Whether he was telling his personal experiences of swimming in and protecting our precious Hudson River, singing the influential songs of Pete Seeger or visiting the hermit's grave, Mr. Ole really embraced experiential hands-on learning and breathed life into everything he taught. I clearly remember learning about the habits and habitats of the caribou in the tundra and how the Inuits carved tools and figures from soapstone. In fact, this is the very hippo that I carved in his class about 45 years ago. I will pass the baton next to Shiva Ramish and Jeremy and Warren Adler. Hi, how are you? It's Shiva Ramesh. I'm class of 2001 Irvington cross country indoor track and outdoor track. Had the pleasure of running for Coach Oli, Coach Mo, and Coach Barry. And cross country, those are probably the, the fondest memories I have of Coach Oli, particularly in the summertime when he would drive us to Rockefeller State Park, or Rockies as he called it. And typically when we were driving with him, he would give a lot of the historical, uh, you know, perspective from the village of Irvington and Terrytown and Sleepy Hollow. And I remember going through lots and lots of red lights during that time. He would get so 
wrapped up in his stories, we were just all in the back thinking, okay, are we gonna, are we gonna survive the experience? But it was always memorable, we would always laugh about it afterward. Um, and uh, it was just great times in the summer and in the fall training for cross country and hearing his voice cheering us on. And uh, for people like me, we weren't, I wasn't the fastest person uh, by any means, but it was always great to hear that voice cheering me on. And I have such great memories of running for Coach Ole. So he's definitely missed, a great mentor, teacher, friend, and coach. And hopefully this uh, is one of many stories for the Historical Society. Thanks so much, have a great day. Hi, I'm Jeremy Adler. I ran for Coach Ole on his cross country and track teams from 1995 until 1999. And with me is my twin brother, Warren Adler. Warren, would you like to introduce yourself? Yes, Warren Adler here. Also ran cross country and track for Coach Ole. I started uh, with his cross country team in 96 after, after running the previous spring track season and uh, ran also through, through the spring track season in 99. So those were, those were some good years of track and field. It was, it was a good time back then. They were some good years. We ended up winning two section titles. And we had a pretty strong team uh, the third year as well in 1998. Um, but, you know, maybe I can just start by talking about when I came on. Um, we were not one of the stronger teams. In fact, looking back at the results from my freshman year, we were actually, you know, last or second to last in, in the section. Um, but I have such fond memories of joining that team in 1995. Um, you know, my first week on the team was incredibly memorable. I got a letter from Coach Ole where he basically said, congratulations, you're on the cross country team. Show up at the high school parking lot at this time and we'll be training. And, you know, I hadn't even thought about joining the cross country team. I didn't really know what it was, but um, it sounded like fun. So I showed up. And for that first week of training before school started, he would drive us out to Rockies and run us over the 13 bridges and all of the hills, um, really to the point of exhaustion, where I would then go home. Uh, my recollection is sleep till the next day and get up and do it again. And, you know, after we would do the run each day, he would take us to bathe our legs in the cold water of the Rockefellers. And, you know, we were not a particularly strong team that year, but he treated us exactly the same as he treated every other team. I mean, he was so into the process of getting kids to love running and love the process of training and teaching us about the sport um, that it really didn't feel any different from any of the other years where we were winning section championships. It's very interesting that you say that because Coach Ole had a long history of understanding track and field and understanding some of the different techniques. But to come in as a high school kid, um, you don't have that perspective. Um, and a lot of what felt so casual at the time, um, I certainly didn't know that it was part of a, a deeper history of, of you know, how he approached track and field. And Ole had this way of slowly revealing um, slowly revealing that to you through stories, through anecdotes about other runners, through anecdotes about track and field history. Um, it all sort of came together in what, what just felt so, um, so natural and so much like, you know, you're developing as a runner and you're learning from him in the process, um, but, but not really feeling like any of it is forced. No, it's very true. And, you know, it, it was a very different time too. Not only did we not know this history, you know, we didn't have the internet. We couldn't even go out and learn this history very easily. And yet, by just spending time with him, he would do things like just start talking about, you know, the flying fins from the 1920s and 30s um, and their training. Um, and, and I remember we went up to um, the Blue Mountain Running Camp one time and he randomly just started talking about these things. And we didn't know where it was coming from. And only when he presented at the camp did we realize he had gone to Pavel Nurmi's house and he had kind of learned all of these things over the summer. But um, they were lessons that we were able to learn that we certainly wouldn't have picked up any other way. There was no way we were gonna hear about these people, these runners, this history, um, you know, from any other source at that time. And talking about you know running before the internet, you know, the other thing that was very hard to, to know about was who are your competitors, who are their coaches, what's going on elsewhere in the world of Westchester and New York State track and field. Um, 
and he always knew all of that. He had his finger on the pulse of, um, you know, you, you would be going to meets and early in the season and he would know exactly who you're going to be racing and had all their stats. And I don't think, you know, if, if we didn't have a coach that, that was so in touch with what was going on in the world of track and field around us, I don't even know how we would have um, a- approached learning what was going on in our competitors and uh, learning what was going on at the other teams that we were racing against. Um, he, he just very much was in touch with the world of track and field around us. And I, I think that was one of the most rewarding things about the team was being able to, to find people who could just you know compete on the county and the sectional level because they had worked so hard. I think one of the things that's really important to say about Oli, and, and one of the, the one of the ways that I would describe him is that he was a storyteller. Uh, fundamentally, you know, the experience of interacting with Oli as a coach was experience him as a storyteller, and it helped create a long arc of Irvington track and field history and broader track and field history. And he made you feel like you were part of something that was much bigger than the t- the individual team that you were competing on at the time. Um, and I think even in high school, you don't even necessarily appreciate that. Um, you know, we we knew that he liked to talk and, and you always got these great stories from him. Um, but I think the further you get from it, you realize that that was part of the experience that he made you really realize you were part of something much bigger. You know, the student athlete, I think, is probably the title that he would have been most proud of um, for all of his athletes being both good athletes and good students. Hi, I'm uh, David uh, Allison, formerly David Darvisey, class of 1988. Um, because of uh, Coach Oli, I was able to run quite well while at Irvington. Uh, various league titles, all county awards, still to this day, some school records, and proudly a third place at the New York State meet in 1988 in the 4 by 400 meters. But more importantly, uh, I became a coach and a teacher mostly because of Coach Oli. Uh, I still remember the gift he and Coach Mo gave me on my wedding day, uh, a program copy from the highly competitive Laux Games. This was such a thoughtful gift because somehow in my senior year in 1988, I was lucky enough to win the boys 3200 meter race. In this program with the names of all past champions by year for each event, and there on the 3200 meter boys champions page was my name. What was even more amazing and moved me profoundly was that Mr. Oli, had included the actual scratch sheet of paper where he had written out my splits during the race, which was bookmarking this page for the past 10 years. But sometimes we fall short of our goals, and that was when Coach Oli really shined. Coach Oli never got angry at you if you didn't perform well. For example, one time as an eighth grader, I had a great chance to win this freshman-only cross-country race up in Blue Mountain. Well, the night before was the middle school Halloween dance, and I went to it and danced a lot. Next day was uh, Blue Mountain, and needless to say, I I ran poorly. Coach Rowley, knowing all the goings-ons around Irvington, calmly came up to me after the race and asked me, matter-of-factly, did you happen to go to the middle school dance last night? I shyly acknowledged the affirmative, and then he said, well, that's too bad, because you had a great chance of winning this race today. There was no mouth in his voice, but just the almost fatherly tone that said, I believe in you, but you're young and know no better. Coach Rowley treated you like family, and, I, and he had a heart big enough to pump the certainty, success, humility, humor, and integrity into the veins of anyone who was fortunate enough to be connected to him, either as a student, athlete, or in the community. Next, I'll be about Tom Bell, class of 1980 who wrote, having played football freshman year as a sophomore, I joined cross country for my junior and senior years. Being new to running, I still vividly remember Coach Oli telling me how to properly hold the hands and position my fingers while running. 43 years later, I'm still competing in road races and still hark back to his coaching and training methods. And yes, 
how I should be holding my hands. Next is Tim Bell, AKA T Bell, class of 1985. He writes, Mr. Oley was my fifth grade teacher at Dow's Lane, but the initial relationship expanded to being my track coach for four years and cross country coach for two years. While I remember the phrases, the clock doesn't lie and hip pockets, I think back and smile when I remember our local mini bus treks, setting up the tent and the overnights to upstate New York and the pen relays. I will always be grateful that he convinced me to give up my 140 pound tight end football career and get into distance running. I was fortunate to be close friend, be a close friend and in the same class as his son, Eric, which gave me the special bonus of having more time to be with Coach Ole and hear about those who came before me and regale me with those finished greats. Next is John Leone, high school class of 99. He writes, being part of the Coach Ole legacy was an incredible experience and honor. As many years have passed since Irvington High School athletics, I look back now as I appreciate even more the commitment, time, and lessons Coach Ole gifted to his team, students, and the village of Irvington. Next, Stan Liu, class of 1997, writes, Coach Ole was a constant figure of motivation with a jolly smile and a bellowing laugh to make us track runners feel welcome. Running came for me at a time when I needed it most. I had suffered the earth shattering loss of a friend when Andrea, then a freshman at Irvington High, passed away. She was like family to me and running gave me an outlet to channel that emotion into something other than grief. To this day, some 20 plus years later, Running is still my greatest source of meditation and peace. I have coach to thank for that. Much like me, many of the track team members of years yonder still run regularly and still motivate each other, just like Coach Oli did all those years ago. We carry on his legacy, mile after beautiful mile, every step of the way. And lastly, Sam Gordon, class of 2005, writes, in Mr. Oli's final year of coaching, I was the definition of average, but to Coach Ole, that made me significant. What made Mr. Ole a great coach, especially for me, was that he gave me the same level of encouragement to all his athletes, regardless of talent. Mr. Ole taught me to love running. He's the reason why I continue running during my first year in college, and despite about a mid-season tendonitis, I was able to will myself through my first marathon, marathon last May. It's a great regret of mine that I never had the opportunity to tell him this. Ironic then that Mr. Ole wanted running to be my fourth priority. Family, friends, and schoolwork all took precedence in his mind. He taught me more than anything that life was about balance, about love, about pursuing your passions. He's the reason why right now at 1130 on a Sunday night, I'm writing this instead of reading 100 pages about medical anthropology for class tomorrow. He's the reason why I learned to balance my priorities. He's the reason why that most humbling moment of my life was receiving the first annual Peter Oli Scholarship. Up next is Peter Stork. He was part of the 1974 second place state cross country team, followed by Gina Neal and Chris Moore. I remember I went back to visit Coach Ole in my 20s. I hadn't been back in a, in a long time. I was feeling out of sorts. Um, when I was in Irvington, it was the fall, a weekday. So in the afternoon, I drove up to the high school to see if he was up there running a cross-country practice. Sure enough, there he was over by his station wagon. Some of his runners on the grass around him stretching out. Now I'm feeling all shy and self-conscious but I, I really want to do this, so I, I walk on over. He sees me and his face just lights up. He's got that grin. He says, boys, boys, this is Peter Stork. He starts rattling off my, my, my key races and times, cherry picking only the best. I'd seen him do that for a hundred runners when I was in high school and came back to visit, but I forgot now that he'd done it for me, I felt like a million bucks. All right. Go, Jolie. We are being recorded. This is the Mar family trying for the third time, three times a charm. Hip pockets. Uh, uh, the Mar family here, Neil Mar, Chris Mar, and Gina Mar. 
Uh, we're here to talk about our wonderful friend and uh, coach and teacher, Pete Oley. We've known the Oley family for half a century since we moved to Irvington almost 50 years ago, right, Mom? Yeah. Yes, she's about 48. Yeah, Peter and Mary Ann's um, eldest daughter, Anne, was a great friend of mine in grammar school and high school. Their son, Eric, one of Chris's best friends throughout. Yo! All my mother coached with Pete Oley for decades. My father cut down crazy trees in our backyard with Pete Oley. He's a neighbor. I mean, the guy was in our life and the Oleys were in our life forever with Marianne as well. So what we want to do today is we want to each tell a story about one aspect of our family's relationship with Pete. So I'm going to talk about Pete as a teacher. Chris is going to talk about Pete as a track coach. And my mom will talk about Pete as a track colleague, a fellow teacher, a friend, a neighbor, you know, all that stuff. Um, so to begin with, I first met Pete Oley as a teacher when I was eight years old. Um, so for third and fourth grade, I was in house three. And in the middle school, the, the classes were divided into houses. And most houses had the students move from classroom to classroom. But house three was the progressive house. And we were in one giant room, the cafeteria, with three teachers and 75 kids. And when people looked down there during the day, they called it the zoo because we were all so loud and, and boisterous. People thought we were just playing around, but it turned out the reason we were so turned on was because of people like Pete Oley, who turned us on to learning in, in that room. And I, I remember a couple times the way Pete did that was he didn't just teach us, he had us do things that really got us excited about learning. Um, so rather than teach us about Eskimos, somehow Pete Oley found soapstone <laughs> which Eskimos carved. He brought it into the classroom and we're sitting there carving it with little, you know, saws or something. Um, another instance was the geodesic dome in the 70s. This was a huge, big, popular thing. So somehow Peter only found these giant cardboard, six feet big squares and we built a 25 foot dome that the 70 kids huddled under during class meetings. Um, but the most, you know, amazing memory I ever had of any educational experience was um, when Pete Oley didn't just tell us about the Irvington Hermit, but he got us out and hiked up through the woods from Main Street School up the high school hill into the woods that today bear his name to the Hermit's grave. And when we got there, he, he told us all about Johann Willem Stolting and how he was this educated man from Germany um, who became a recluse and, and made his living by carving these little wooden buttons, right? And then Pete did the classic Pete Oli. He turned to the other side of where the grave was and said, dig, because Pete only knew where <laughs> the man's house was. So we all went over and started digging and we found buttons and bottles and um, little nails from this man's home. I mean, today we couldn't do that, but back then it was one of the most you know, memorable learning experiences of my life. And um, on the way home, um, Pete Oley wasn't feeling that well, and I never saw that because he was such a you know strong guy. But he asked if I could carry his pack back down to the middle school because he he felt a little bit weak. And you know I've never been prouder you know as a third or fourth grader in my life up until then to be carrying uh, Pete Oley's backpack. So I just wanted to say thank you to Pete Oley and the Oley family for giving me this teacher who didn't just teach me but but taught me how to be really, really excited about learning. And he did that by having us do it. We went out there and did it. Um, so that's my memory of Pete Oli as a teacher. And now I'll pass it on to my brother to discuss Pete Oli as a, as a track coach. Thanks, Neil. And as Coach Oli would say, awesome. That was awesome. Uh, I've got a laundry list of memories of Coach Oli, but I'll, I'll pick a, a few quick ones here. Um, for all the gifts that Coach Oli um, had, and, 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 and that is a long list of them, I think one of his most special gifts was how he made every kid on that track team, boy or girl, freshman, senior, best runner, maybe not as talented, um, that they were critically important to our success a, a, as a team. And so whether you were Tom Quinn or Tim Bell or Fran Abagu or Nan Fister or Tara Fitzpatrick, who was gonna go out and probably win a, you know multiple races for us every dual meet and get us those 10 points, he was talking to everybody on that team about how they could contribute a point or a couple of points um, to the success of our team. 
Um, and I think that was a really special gift of his that he made he made every child on in that program feel like that they could contribute to our success. And of course, part of it was about winning meets and he went 40 some odd years without losing a dual meet. But it was really just teaching us a really important lesson about life of doing our best, trying to improve each and every day. And maybe we, you know, as a freshman, you didn't score a point, but he would let you know when you beat your PR by five seconds or 10 seconds. And by the time you were a senior, you were contributing points on a regular basis. And so that's one of my one of my lasting memories of Coach Ole and just the lessons he taught us and that it just everybody mattered and everybody counted. Um, and so that is that is that is something that, that I will remember uh, for the rest for the rest of my life. So with that, I will hand over to you mom right and you're so right about that Chris because uh coach Oli was able to put together teams where everybody did matter because he really really cared about everybody on the team not just the stars of the team and I would ride the bus to we'd get meet, meet outside the school get on the bus on a Saturday morning for a big meet and there was no talking going up there was all business and he had his pencil and he had his notes and he was looking looking and he was deciding this one would go here and they would say to me where are the girls going to go would you have this girl go here, this girl go there. It was all business, all talk. And he, we would get up there and every person that was on that bus felt important and was part of winning. Whether it was, it was a dual meet or a championship meet, every person did it because he had figured it out and he had done it in a way that every person on the team mattered. The bus ride home, however, was another story. The bus ride home, he was free, he had done it. And we would start through the towns and no matter where we were, there was a story. It was a story about the guy who owned the, bar the barbershop. There was a story about somebody who walked the paths of the river. Or there was a story about the environment. But there was always a story and, and a history and a, and, a, and a lot of humor was thrown into it. He would tell little anecdotes about, well, they were funny people, but they did this and they did that. And he, he just was a wonderful, wonderful man. And, and buses rides were, were important. And, and I know everybody that went to the Penn Relays with Pete Ole must remember how he would drive to the Penn Relays. The school had a minibus and, and there'd be maybe 12 kids on the minibus going down to Penn Relays. And he would hit that place and he'd go to make a turn and hit the curb and he'd go to make another turn and hit another curb and he would just say, Curb City. He, would, <laughs> he also made it a point on those, on, on those trips to Philadelphia, which is such a great historical place, to stop at the Rocky Steps and everybody would run the Rocky Steps. And we would always go to the museum. And, and do wonderful things. He, he, he was just a great, great, great friend, a great man. Um, he, and, he and his wife were just fantastic people and good friends of ours. And, and um, I'm so privileged and lucky to have had over 25 years coaching with Peter Oley. And I thank him very much. You know, one thing we've all talked about is it's not just about getting to a place with Pete, right? Yeah. It's about the trip. It's about the journey yeah. and how much you get out of that travel with him. You know, traveling through life with Peter Oley was memorable and and um, worth a lot, you know? So I think that's a great way to think about him. Right. Yeah. yeah, that's a great, that's a great, that's a great point. Amazing trip. It was an amazing trip. Chris, you can end with your, your saying, go ahead. Hip pockets, hip pockets. Hip pockets. <laughs> All right, we love you, Oli's. We love Pete Oli, and uh, thanks for including us um, in this great, great tribute. Thanks so much, everybody. Thanks, thanks everyone. Everybody. Thanks. Wow, Curb City. Yes, indeed. Um, hello, uh, my name is Noah Cornman. I'm the class of '92. Uh, half miler, uh, reluctant thousand meter runner, and an occasional triple jumper. Um, Coach Oli, Coach Oli is a lot of things to a lot of people. And for me, he started as my neighbor, the dad of some of my neighborhood friends. Uh, there were always a lot of multi-talented and fun folks up on Riverview Road, a lot of Riverview Road. Uh, he was my math teacher at Dow's Lane. And eventually I found my way onto the track after getting unceremoniously cut from the tennis team my junior year. Uh, let's get to this. The beauty of Peter K. Oley, the human being, is he loved you for who you were, whether you were the state champion or the last one across the finish line. He met you where you were to celebrate you for you. He created a culture of community and joy, and in the midst of all of it, a tradition of teamwork and spirit that led to incredible success. 
a tradition that continues and is a source of great pride for the village of Irvington. Now I'm gonna share a few stories. Uh, this is from Barbara Ginsburg, uh, Dow's Lane librarian and a colleague of Peter Ole. Let's see if we can get this up here. There it is. Thanks so much for reaching out to Peter's former colleagues to share memories of one of the most unique individuals I have ever known. Peter had all the hallmarks of a great teacher. He was unflaggingly patient, caring, and kind, and had the unique ability to develop relationships with each of his students while actively engaging them in learning. We were fortunate enough to be teaching in Irvington in the quote, golden years, that incredible time when there was no such thing as teaching to the test and the staff was not hampered in their teaching styles. And Peter's style was unique. I can vividly remember walking into his classroom after his class had just gotten back from one of their local field trips to the hermit's grave and getting a rousing rendition of John Jacob Jingleheimer Schmidt. My first encounter with Peter was in the fall of 1986 when I first arrived at Dow's Lane as the new librarian. Steve Fisher, the superintendent at that time, introduced me at, at the superintendent's day meeting as his recruit from Scarsdale. As the meeting was breaking up, someone tapped me on my shoulder and when I turned around, there was Peter asking me if I was related to David Ginsburg. When I said that I was his mother, his eyes lit up and he started dragging people over to me exclaiming, do you know who this is? This is David Ginsburg's mother. He's the greatest runner in all of Westchester. I know I'm not alone when I say that you cannot think of Peter without having a giant smile on your face. Next is Tom Johnson, Irvington High School colleague, art and photography teacher, and of course, the backbone of Willie and the Wonders as their drummer. From Tom, when I came to Irvington High School in 1978 to teach art and photography, I was soon to meet Mr. Peter Ole. We would often have informal sessions in the halls that covered all sorts of topics, but mostly his beloved Irvington. I know that Pete, by example, made me a more knowledgeable and better teacher. One fact about these talks is that they were never a minute or too long, and I rarely wanted them to be shorter, even when I was in a hurry. As we worked together to further the interest in our students to know about their village and the surrounding area, I realized that we were a team. This was best displayed in how we helped Rob Yassensack research and photograph the ruins in the Hudson Valley. I know that one of his proudest accomplishments is that Rob dedicated the book he co-authored with Tom Rinaldi to Peter Ole. Next up, this is from Tim Fulton, a coaching colleague. Coach Ole was simply one of the nicest men I have ever met, a true gentleman and a great lover of track and field. As a coach, he was superb. His squads were always well-rounded and competed as a team, something not all track and field teams achieve. His stats are proof of his coaching ability, but spend any amount of time around him, and you saw what all of his athletes did over the years, that he loved everyone he met. I got to know Pete a little better at running camp every summer, spending time listening to his jokes, and hearing about his world travels. Pete always asked me about my granddad, always congratulated me on my latest accomplishments as a coach and always bragged about his kids, be it his actual children or the ones he coached. Peter Ole is one of the most successful outdoor track and cross country coaches the state has ever seen. Overall, his track and cross country teams captured a combined 27 section one titles and helped Peter earn 12 coach of the year accolades. Next up, this is from Jim Riesler, a New York Times sports writer from a 1995 New York Times article. Looking south on a fall day from Peter K. Ole's third floor deck, high above Irvington, there is a view all the way to the Manhattan skyline. Look west and there is a view of Irvington's bis business district in the Hudson River. About the only landmark that cannot be seen is Irvington High School's all-weather track, officially named the Peter K. Ole Track. Good, said Ole's wife, Marianne, with a laugh. We see it often enough. In the basement study of Ole's house were photographs and memorabilia, including dozens of team photos of past Irvington cross-country and track teams. 
Oli can recall almost every runner down to their best times, who their parents are, where they went to college, and what they do today. Quote, our records are a testimonial to all these kids and this community where there has always been a lot of support, Oli said. This is a hard sport, and I've always managed to have and bring along a bunch of incredibly motivated kids with a real work ethic. It's a real tradition we have here now. And finally, from me, as many of you have, you have heard, there are just too many stories to count. Runs at Rockefeller, AKA the Rockies, Penn Relays Adventures, Curb City, the New York State Meet, the iconic booming arms coming across the field as I was digging deep for a final 100 meter kick. I will share one of the moments that was seemingly simple and at the same time was everything. There was an open meet one winter weekend up at West Point. It wasn't an Irvington track team event, but coach suggested I go compete in the thousand meter dash. My father and I got up early to make the trek north. Thanks, dad. The meet was going to be our whole day. To my great surprise, when we arrived, there was the unmistakable presence of Coach Ole, holding court, quoting the times run by officials there from their youth, sharing tales of other meets there and introducing me and my father as only Peter K. Ole could. And he didn't have to be there. This was a weekend when he could have been home, taking a trip, taking a nap, but he gave that day to me. I couldn't tell you what my time was that day. He, of course, could, but I can tell you that it didn't matter. I could have turned around and gone home after seeing him and felt loved, supported, seen, and celebrated. Beyond the iconic moments of awards and accolades and championships, these were the moments that define the man that he was. In the end, the thing that Coach Oli showed us was just how awesome things can be. And no matter where you might be on any given day, high, low, or in between, Coach Oli would make sure that you had some awesome worked into your day, your week, and your life. It was an honor to know him and a continuing honor to know his kids and his grandkids. Long live Peter K. Oli. Next up, we've got. Uh, a video from Chris Berry. Hi, I'm Chris Berry. I have been here in Irvington for 22 years. I've been the boys and girls cross country coach for the past 15 years uh, and boys spring track coach as well. Um, I was lucky enough to when I first got here, I worked with Coach Oli as his assistant for my first seven years in the spring. Um, some memories I have of Coach Oli, uh, he was, um, he knew everything about every event, first of all, um, and he was always thinking about the, the big picture. Um, not only was he somebody who um, wanted to make sure we had the, the most talent lined up the best for us team-wise, um, but he also wanted to make sure everything was under control and as good as it could be. One, one example I remember from that is uh, we went to an invitational in the Maranek, I believe, and he gave me the relay cards in the old days pre-computer. You put the card, fill them out by hand and put them in the, the appropriate envelope. And he gave me the cards to put in. And I had coached for six years before I got here, so I was comfortable doing that. And, and yet, as I put in the cards in the 4x100, the 4x200, the distance bending relay, I saw that he was watching behind me to make sure that I put the right card in the right envelope. So that's when I realized he was serious and he wasn't going to accept any mistakes in that regard. Um, and over time, uh, you know, having worked with him for seven years, happily we got to a point I think where we had a level of trust and support for each other. Um, a moment, another moment I remember is as we were planning out uh, our league championship meet, which we always did extremely thoroughly after practice one day. We had it all set up except for the 4x400 relay. We were looking for one more man. And I think at this point, the DeCesar twins were young. Uh, Scott DeCesar was still available for an event. And he said, well, who could it put in for the fourth leg? And I said, what about Scott DeCesar in the, in the fourth leg for the 4x4? And he had that big smile that he had that grin that those who remember Pete remember well. And he just looked at me and just goes, coach, 
that's a good move. Uh, so then I knew I was, I was in, I was okay, it was good. Um, the, the things about his program that I remember and that I um, have tried to do the best to continue, it's all about everyone. Everyone has a, has a role to play. It's not about what talent level you have. We've been lucky enough, and Coach Ole was certainly lucky enough, and the record board behind shows this, to have some tremendous athletes. Uh, Scott and Casey DeCesar were both Division I athletes, both went to UCLA, both individual state champions in the pole vault. Uh, we had relays uh, go to states uh, repeatedly, um, multiple section championships, I mean, and the main thing was the league championship. We always tried to win the league championship every year. Um, but And yet there's not just a role for those talented types, but a role for everybody. Um, even if it was, you know, being the fourth guy in the mile, um, everybody knew that they were contributing to a team to a team title, ideally, and that's something we've tried to keep going. Um, we, I've been lucky also to have some talented runners, and we've had some successes, certainly. Um, I tell people, you know, earnestly, I, I, I truly believe my job is to try to keep the ball rolling. Um, he was here for 50 years. I've been here now as head coach for 15, and it's always astounding to me to think that I feel like I've been doing it for a while, but 15 compared to 50. Uh, but we've had, uh, again, we've had uh, hopefully the same kind of thing with large teams. Um, we've, we've won some sectional titles with cross country in recent years. Um, this past fall, as weird as it was, our boys and girls both did very well. Um, and in our indoor program, we've had some good success. The boys won a sectional title last year, just before the pandemic shut everything down. Um, and um, this past winter, where we had no meets basically because the snow took out the track, we had a couple of scrimmages early, we were able to have one meet uh, in a parking garage over at the Palisades Mall. Uh, and in many ways, I think it captured what Coach Ole's view of track was all about. It was um, everybody cheering as hard as they could, everybody running as hard as they could on pavement in a parking lot. Um, our boys four by uh, 600 relay, which is not an unusual event, did extremely well to get nipped at the line by Somers, otherwise best team out there. And our girls four by 300 relay won the whole thing. And again, not relays you normally run, but we had a 300 meter track indoors and the spirit and the cheering and the excitement and the competition um, coach only would have loved it um, and it, I think it just shows what our kids are up for if it's a garage they're gonna work hard uh, they're gonna cheer for each other everyone's gonna have a role our top kids are gonna do really well but every kid's gonna have a, have a role and that's I think that's one of the principles that in our program we've had uh, that coach only established so like I said I'm honored to try to continue his legacy as best I can um, but very lucky to have gotten to work with him and very lucky to have gotten to take over uh, after he finally retired after 50 years. It's been fun presenting an our Irvington icon. It's clear that Pete's light continues to shine on. His stories, his impact are like a relay baton passed on to all of us here who shall carry it on. Okay, um, waiting for our panelists to check back in here. Uh, here we go, very nice. Uh, 
thanks one and all for being here. We're gonna we're gonna use the chat button um, to take any questions or comments. But I would like to begin uh, first of all by thanking all of you who, who tuned in today. Uh, we had a big number, and it was just it's really great that so many people are interested. It just speaks volumes about the impact Peter's had on so many people. But I'd like to start the chat with a, a question for Eric, actually, and and I, I'm curious what you think, Eric, what your dad would have thought about this particular presentation today. Oh, he would have been absolutely thrilled. He, he loved hearing from his former athletes and students. And he actually, he, he heard from them often. They often came back, like Peter Stork was, was mentioned in his speech. And I know that he also felt really appreciated during his lifetime when he was teaching, when he was coaching, and then also when he was in retirement. And, you know, from the bottom of the Oli family's heart, I would just like to say thank you to the community for making me feel that way. Nice. Yeah, I, you know, as people, people have gone into the hip pockets and the curved city, I, you know, I, I'm sure there were smiles all around the place as uh, people remembered uh, the various quirks and the, the things that, that were unique to him. Um, okay, uh, Nancy Fisher, this is going to be to you. What is the finish line? Since you were the one who came up with that title. <laughs> Um, that's a tribute to uh, Peter Oley's um, heritage because he was proud of his heritage. He, he talked about it all the time. It just was a, an integral part of who he was. Um, I mean, obviously our heritage is, but, but he really took pride in it. And um, uh, I loved hearing his stories. I mean, we all talk about the stories, but um, I just thought that was um, apropos for this because of that. I think you had the, you know, Marina Finn, right? Father laws of right. <laughs> Olympian javelin thrower. So the connect, this, the Finnish connection was very strong. <laughs> uh, uh, Eric, there might be a question here for you. Uh, was Peter a runner himself when he was young? I, I know he ran in high school. Did, did absolutely, was... absolutely. And he had an incredible mentor in uh, Doc Rasbeck when he, my father was a runner at North Tarrytown High School. And I think my father, he got so much out of the relationship that he went to college to become a teacher to study teaching and then he became a teacher and a coach and he he just really wanted to help people the same way that i think uh dr rasbeck helped him so it, it's just i mean it, it's a wonderful cycle that continues on and still <laughs> continues on to this day i would say the dna is pretty strong in that only household um you know, with, with son liam and i just want to do a shout out for liam while we're, we're talking here about what a great job he did with the music it was you know, putting this thing all together and just to hear it uh, in its in its entirety was was really special. Um, it was awesome. We actually have somebody who checked in from Finland. This must be a, a holy connection, um, right, Ollie? Right? Yeah, any connection to you, Eric, from Finland? Um, you guys looking at the chat ring? So, um, is there any other questions here? Fred Kellogg, thanks for chiming in. Good to hear from you. Uh, Class of 62, this is awesome. Uh, Carl Haggerty, uh, you were in there at one point on the uh, on the Empire State Games. I believe we saw your picture. On here's that. a photo, yes. Uh, here's another one for Eric. What happened to Peter's MG? You know what? I don't know. I mean, I have no memory of that, but I found the pictures, obviously. Um, I think my mom gave it the kibosh. You know, he, she, he bought that pre uh, Marianne Oli. And I know that when they came home, my father met my mother in Finland when he had gone to Europe during the summer to actually to follow track meets around Europe. And Helsinki uh, would always host a big meet during the summer. And he ended up befriending some athletes, some Finnish athletes, and went to a party after one of the meets and met my mother there. Because like you mentioned, uh, my mother's father was actually, he was, I think he was president of the Finnish Track Association at that time. Uh, he had already been an athlete earlier. And, they got ended up getting married in Finland a couple of years later, and they came home on a boat from uh, to the United States, and they also brought a Volvo home. So he had a Volvo wagon when he was first married with my mom to my mom. Red car is gone. Gone. Well, similar to the, the bachelor days, I guess. Um, yes, exactly. And Dean Joy, Gene, of course, Deutsche wrote in when he wrote his thing about how memorable that trip was to do with Peter in the MG. Oh, that must have been something. Uh, yeah, just a lot of great comments are coming in here. Uh, you know, here's a, just a wonderful thing from Steve Hamburg about uh, buying tickets to the 72 Olympics and sitting with him in, uh, in Munich. Um, awesome. That, here, you got me saying awesome. That must have been a, a tremendous experience. Um, and again, a lot of thanks here. A lot of, a lot of great comments about Coach Ole. Um, oh, Debbie King. Yep, Talbot. Um, 
Uh, so there's uh, one question here. I don't know, Nancy, if you know this, but when the girls track program started at Irvington Cross Country, I, I have a sense it was a few years or a year or two after the, um, you know, Title IX kicked in in, in 72. Um, I think somewhere around there, maybe it started. Is that your sense of it also? Yeah, I, I, I believe so. Um, that predates me, but, um, <laughs> or not me, but <laughs> the time that I was running. Um, but yeah, that sounds about right. I, I think so, at least in mid seventies at the very least. Okay, here's a, here's a. Hi Annie. Here's, here's another one, Eric. Uh, gray Volvo Fastback before the station wagons. Yeah, so I have memories of that in our in our driveway. It was uh, you know under a tarp in our driveway in Irving Place. Uh, my father never got it running again, but that was the car that they brought home from from Sweden. I mean, they, they brought it home from Sweden. It was shipped from Sweden when my parents were first married. So I see Byron Haynes there. I think it's Byron Haynes asking about a Saab, but Byron, the, uh, it was not a Saab, it was a Volvo. Okay, and I think Annie Talbot's got a, a nice memory here, which I, I can certainly uh, re recall swimming across the reservoir with, um, with the team. Um, and I remember, I should not say this, but this was years ago, so maybe I can get away with it. But I remember we used to put our shoes on one side, we'd barefoot to the other side. So that when we swam across and the police happened to show up, we'd have our shoes on and we could take off. And I didn't ever have any 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 uh, doubts that we would be able to stay clear because you know it was a runner and they knew the woods, so I, we were uh, we, we were okay with that. Um, uh, you know, this is being recorded. So yeah. Just, okay. <laughs> just Zach Lynch would have caught us, I think. Stat statute of limitations, hopefully. <laughs> Hello, Talbots. Yeah. Talbots. Uh, so Fribbles, anybody want to ask about, anybody have a memory of Fribbles? From well, that's Sue Broadhurst there, yes. Uh, we, would, we would often stop at Friendly's, um, the restaurant establishment, and uh, my father's favorite drink ever was probably a Friendly Fribble, which is a, sh a very, sh uh, very thick shake. Um, so yes, we've had many Friendly Fribbles over the years. Okay. What was his flavor of choice? You know, he, he would actually get a mocha, which is which is a combination of chocolate and coffee ice cream. Thank you for asking, though. <laughs> okay, Eric, here's another one for you. And Eric, Eric, of course, is a real historian in this group, that's for sure. But what about the Finnish umflas, old sweatsuits? Oh, those were some awesome. I don't know if we had any pictures of them, but they, yeah, there was one year. My, you know, my parents would go back to Finland a lot because my mother was obviously from Finland. So during the summers, you know, my father was a teacher. Um, we would go back when I was very young in the early 70s to Finland during the summers. And one time he found these um, really cool sweatsuits. They were different than like the baggy ones that they, that they had in the United States. They were kind of streamlined and uh, they were this great green color with a, with a white collar. And he, he got kids to like pull money and he, he, uh, he probably got my mom's family to, to organize an order. And, they ordered these sweatsuits from Finland, which of course they must have looked incredibly unique uh, at the track meets and the cross country meets in Westchester. But those were the um, those were those sweatsuits. Well, it sounds like the, he, the, there was a, maybe a change in direction when Tom Quinn ended up wearing the <laughs> wouldn't wear the green shorts for the no linings to so the satin shorts. Those were a little bit of a different uh, fashion move. I'd if tell. you if you break fifty seconds in the quarter mile, you can wear whatever shorts you there, want. Scott. There you go. There you go. Um, okay, coach took a shopping idea from Yvonne. Yeah, I think he did that all the time. He just say to a kid after practice, look, you need a new pair of track shoes. Yeah, we're going to the Westchester Road and get in the car and off they'd go. Um, I, uh, routine. Um, that was just the way and probably paid for it a bunch of times as well. Knowing coach Ole. My first, my first, when I first ran around the track to, he wanted to see what I had. I was wearing tree torns and I, he very quickly got those off of me and got me into proper running shoes. Okay. Uh, another memory from, you got a, another one from Finland. You seen that one, Eric? Yeah, well, that's Auntie Niku. I, this was after my time, but I remember that there were, we had a couple of uh, Finnish uh, students come to, to take a couple of years of high school in, oh. in the United States. And Auntie was one of those. Hi, Auntie. I, I'm remembering that also. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, some more comments here. Um, and Chad, I saw your, I'll save in that question for later, Chad, about the next uh, presentation on Peter, but we'll save that for the end. Um, oh, wow, this is an interesting one about from the 60s. Uh, there was a young lady that ran, uh, obviously there was no team for the young ladies at that point, but culturally worked with her, that's awesome. Um, 
Okay, unless anybody's got a last question for us here, uh, I would like to, uh, a couple of things. One, I mentioned earlier in a presentation that um, we will try to put together another, another Peter Oli uh, presentation because this just encompasses one part of Peter Oli. Uh, his role as a village activist and, and environmentalist um, and historian, he was the president of the society for many years. Uh, there's a whole other part of, of Peter Oli that we'd like to put, put out at some point. Um, it'll take a while to put that together, of course, but, but eventually we'll, we'll get to that. Um, and I just, um, Eric, I just want to say thanks to your family. Uh, you know, as I looked at this, I've watched this now a bunch of times, obviously, but I just, I just have to think what a remarkable woman your wife, your mom was, um, to, to, to give Peter the freedom to, to just, you know, be so important in so many kids' lives. And, and, and that's hard, I think, when the spouse at home, um, and, and yet, you know, off he was down going off the track meets. Uh, I, th I think you, probably attended more track and cross country meets than any other kid in America by the time you were 10, uh, which meant you were in the car and driving and, and, and mom was home, of course, with the girls or whatever, but uh, a remarkable family um, that, that you all had. And, and again, your wife was, your, I keep saying your wife, she's special too, but I meant to say your mom, uh, just, a, just a saint, um, always admired her. Um, so in any event, um, Thanks again to everybody. I, I think this has been, it's been really fun for, for me, for us, I think. Uh, I couldn't pick four better folks to, to join in here. And, and obviously the video folks, if you guys are watching, you guys were terrific. Uh, I would like to end with uh, the Irvington Historical Society president, Veronica Gedrich. Hi, Veronica. Hi, Scott. And congratulations, webinar team. You've put together a wonderful tribute to a wonderful guy. Um, I think we all really appreciate your work. Thank you again. And thank you visitors for joining us today. If you've missed any of our recent programs, they've been posted on our website, www.irvingtonhistoricalsociety.org. Uh, 